All right, guys, we are in Brooklyn. I'm using my gimbal for the first time, so hopefully I get a hand of this thing. It's supposed to make my video a little smoother. But it's a little bit of a learning curve, so I'm trying to figure this out. Anyway, why are we in Brooklyn today? Well, I wanted to do this video uh, tomorrow, but I looked at the forecast, and... Uh, supposed to be rain so I had to get my ass up and uh, make my way out here didn't plan it but here we are and we are at Avenue P Avenue P I'll get the hang of this. So why are we on Avenue P? Well, you saw the title of this video. Now, if you know anything about the story of uh, Roy DeMeo, you know that this is where it all begins, right here on Avenue P. So when he is just a little baby, they move over here to Avenue P. He's got a, soon he'll have a sister well, I believe his sister, if I'm not mistaken, is a couple years older than him. And then his brother is about a decade older than him. And about 10 years after Roy's born, there's another child born. I believe that history is correct. So, two brothers and a sister. And he grows up here on Avenue P. And, like I said, this is where it all begins. Now, how do they know exactly where to go here on Avenue P? Well, that took some interesting research. It's been a topic for people who are interested in Roy's story for a little while as to where exactly this place was. I had to do some, uh, you know, creative research, I suppose, to find out exactly where this place is. Because in Murder Machine, it doesn't say it. And uh, multiple other sources. How I did it, um... Unfortunately, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to give the address either. But we will show you the house. So if you read that book, Murder Machine, and if you know anything about the story, you know that he grows up here. He's got a group of friends. He's got the Faranji brothers. He's got the um, Doherty brothers. And then there's the Profaci boys. The family of Joseph Profaci. His nephews are living on this block. Roy's friends with them. And he, uh, you know, they hang out on the porch. They hang out on the stoop. And he gets to see these wise guys in their Cadillacs. And, you know, that's something that kind of, uh, I suppose, was alluring to him. And then 1951, his older brother, unfortunately, dies in the Korean War. And then some of the accounts of the neighbors and some of the stuff from murder machine it's kind of the you know obviously the family's in grief and roy starts to have a kind of an odd relationship with his father they're fighting and things are kind of getting funny and he becomes a bully so before that um he would have kind of been picked on i believe he was a little chubby fat kid and but, you know, he becomes his own little bully over there at St. Thomas Aquinas, which we're also going to walk to so we can check that out. And, um, yeah, so give me a second. Let me pass this gentleman over here. Good morning. So, yeah, that happens. And, um... So the family obviously is in grief and uh, he's got these crazy little friends over here and so let's see and I'm going to put a picture up of what the uh, the uh, house would have looked like back then because I found it but um, we're just about here now this is the home when you read Murder Machine and you hear about Avenue P you're hearing about this block right here. Let me use my gimbal. Ooh, look at that slow little move of the camera. 
somebody recently put a comment, oh, uh, five minutes in, I get car sick, and I'm not even driving. Uh, don't quit your day job, or whatever the hell they say. Well, I assure you I'm not quitting my day job because uh, I can't afford to at the moment. But I'm trying to get better, so I got this little cool gimbal here, and I'll be better at it soon. And, um, yeah, I'll keep working my day job. So here we are. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. And let's see. Let's get a look at the house. There you go, with that yellow piece right there. There you go. That is the home, Roy DeMeo's childhood home. Right there on here on Avenue P. As I said, I will put a picture of what the house would have looked like at that time. Now, on the cover of Sins of My Father by Albert DeMeo, there's a driveway and Roy's in the driveway with his Cadillac. Could it have been that driveway right there? Quite possibly, I think it might have been where that picture was taken. Probably to the left over there, I would assume. So that's the house, guys, right there. Right here in Avenue P. He would have been chilling on that porch with all his friends, checking out what was going on. I don't know where the Profaci house was or anyone else, but there it is. This is a predominantly uh, Jewish area right now. Um, on the map, it says we're in, well, there you go, some Orthodox Jews there. So on the map it says Marine Park, but we're surrounded by like, uh, you got like Flatlands, Midwood, Flatbush, or kind of all these neighborhoods around here. Um, so that's the house there, and this is Avenue P. So let's uh, move away from this home here, and let's walk up to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, which I believe is uh, left up ahead on what's called Hendrickson Street, I believe. So let's head that way and uh, we'll talk more. So we went over uh, a little bit of uh, that block growing up, some of the characters he was around. And uh, we'll just take this walk so you can kind of get a feel of uh, maybe that walk that those Roy and his buddies would have taken to the school over here. Now we, we know the story. You know, I covered Roy a lot. Um, my friend Quentin Walker at the Darkness Underneath podcast and a buddy of mine, Roderick Molina, we are constantly researching this story and finding new stuff and trying to talk to people and uncover new things. There's a lot to be uncovered. But this one is the first spot here on uh, this video here. So, and obviously this is the beginning. This plays an important role. And we know the story of Roy. We know that... Um, you know, he then goes to high school at Madison after um, Aquinas, and he graduates there around 59. And while he's there, he's uh, loan sharking, and he's becoming a bit of a neighborhood badass, you know. And shortly after that, you know, a few years after his father dies in 1960, he, you know, starts messing around with some of the Lucchese characters of the junkyard scene over there in Canarsie, and... Then he meets old Nino Gaggi, and you know, the rest is history. You guys know the history, but um, we'll talk more about that as the video goes on, I suppose. But this is like the basic stuff that I've discussed a bunch of times, but it's just important to come and see this area, to see this block, and uh, where it begins, where it ends, is the title of this video. So let's get a view of over here, down Avenue P. It is fucking cold, guys. Ooh. It is cold. It's about 18 degrees out here. My hands are freezing. All right, but let's continue on. So, you know, he starts loan sharking out of high school, and I think around... You know, by the time he meets, like, up with some of those Lucchese guys and gadgets, he's already out of his home, um, and he has a child in around 1960. Um, and by 66, he has moved out to Massapequa, and he builds his first home in 1966, 
that is not the home that you see in that barbecue video. That is not that home. Um, that one over on Whitewood Drive, he moved into in the late 70s. And the other one was in Massapequa at another location, which maybe I'll talk about one day, but it was another spot in Massapequa. And as he got older, you know, I mentioned one of his friends, uh, the Ferrangi brothers, you know, his friend, uh, one of his closer friends, Frank Ferrangi also moves out there to uh, Massapequa. And uh, he's mentioned in that book a few times. Also mentioned in the later years of Roy, not just, uh, not just the uh, younger years growing up. All right, so this is cool, guys. You got to see that house. Um, which, listen, I don't think anyone has ever showed it. So, you know, and I'm not giving the address, like I said. Call me an asshole, call me whatever you want. You know, there is some stuff, you know, listen. I don't want to sound like a jerk or whatever, but there is some things, and I'm not mentioning the video or two that I did where I showed some places for the first time and no one fucking showed them. And then like a month later, someone will pop on Facebook showing the spot like they did some research oh this is the spot listen listen guys give me some credit if you're gonna go uh using all my leg work but it's okay it's okay i'm not mad i'm just making a point um so let's see here we are st thomas aquinas right here Go look at that nativity scene there. Let's not get hit by a car. All right, guys, look at this. St. Thomas Aquinas. And I think that there is a yearbook photo also of Roy from this school available online. I'll post that too. We'll just continue walking. Just got snow uh, yesterday. Most of it's gone. Uh, but man, it's a brick out here. All right. There we go. Mother Mary. Roman Catholic Church, founded 1885. Whew. All right, guys. Mary with Jesus, a little ode to Michelangelo's Pieta, which in October of 2019, I got to see at the Vatican when I went to Italy, right before the corona. I think I could walk through this uh, yard here to the other side, to the other block there, so I'm going to do that. Sorry for some of the abrupt angle changes. I'm kind of getting used to this thing, as I said. But I think so far it's like been so helpful. I can see these shots are like really steady and it's pretty cool. So, walking through the courtyard here at St. Thomas Aquinas. Next time I gotta bring gloves. Okay, so we just walked through the courtyard, heading back to Avenue P. And uh, this is the first stop of this uh, video that I'm putting out here. Where it begins, where it ends. 
and it begins on Avenue P. Now, after this, we're gonna be going to a uh, couple of spots in relation to Roy's demise. And uh, there's a couple of things about that that have been floating around online for a long time that are not exactly clear and sometimes don't even tell the truth. So I am going to cite directly the events of the discovery from the FBI files. Now, does the FBI always tell the truth? Absolutely not. But with something like this, I mean, we're just talking about, um, you know, one little event as far as um, how Roy was discovered in his trunk and how the car was initially uh, discovered. So I think we can trust those the the count the recount of uh, those events i don't think it's uh, <laughs> i need to lie or to make anything up so um and when we get to those locations i'll read um i'll read from those files and we'll get a clear picture exactly as to what went on when that cadillac was found <sighs> on january 20th of uh, 1983 Now, I say found on January 20th. Well, as we'll discuss, it was first spotted on January 10th, the day I'm releasing this video. Now, that car was not messed with for another 10 days after that. That car sat there for 10 days after it being seen. So, I say discovered on the 20th. Well, maybe that's not exactly correct, but... Roy's body was discovered on January 20th of 83. And we're gonna go over that. So we'll set kind of, uh, we'll kind of set the facts straight. We'll kind of set the uh, timeline of events straight and uh, we'll talk about it. Back on Avenue P again. For those of you who followed Roy's story and um, Red Murder Machine and anything else, just recount those events in your head right now that you read about his childhood growing up over here and you know think about it heading back to where the house was right now now I have covered uh, Roy a lot on my channel. Um, let's get one more look at the house there. The door's open at the moment right there. Okay. I covered him a lot on my channel and I'll continue to do some more here and there. This will be the last one for a little while. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my buddy Quentin uh, Walker on Darkness Underneath does a lot of stuff. Um, I'm not running like a Roy channel, you know, and this year I am moving a little away from that mob stuff too, working in some of the other New York City crime stories, the forgotten ones, the, the low key ones. I'm gonna be releasing one after this video gets down. That's one of those type of videos and that video takes place in Canarsie. And it's a wild one, guys, it's a wild one. But for now, Back to Mr. Roy Albert de Mayo, which people seem to like anyway. So if I could shed some new information or show you some guys some locations, I mean, hell yeah, right? I know you guys like it. So let's head down Avenue P here. And uh, I think we'll call it quits for now. We're going to head over to the next location. I think this was pretty good just touching on some of the childhood stuff for Roy. I mean, a lot of his exploits is, you know, we spoke about it so many times, but the goal was to come here and see the house and take a little walk over to St. Thomas. And I don't have a script, so, you know, sometimes I just end up blabbing away and 
you know, who knows what's gonna come out of my mouth. But uh, let's look down Avenue P and then we'll call it quits for a little bit. If I could figure this out. So we're looking down Avenue P. All right, guys, I will be back. All right, guys, we are here at entering onto East 89th Street, specifically 432 East 89th Street. Now, let's talk about this property right here to the left. So this is a big property um, with the main address being on Avenue D right ahead, 888. 8802 Avenue D. Now, these addresses here in East 89th Street go from 432 to 452 East 89th Street. 432 being the address of Patty Testa's garage, where it is said to be where Roy DeMeo was murdered, the spot. Now, being that the numbers are going, they're going higher as we head towards this way, I'm going to assume that 432 would be right over here. I'm gonna assume behind these walls right here, perhaps this garage was Patty Testa's garage. Right behind these walls here. Where Roy DeMeo met his fate on a cold January night in 1983. Now, a couple of other things here. Not only did he have this garage right here, but from what I'm told, and I'm gonna also cite an article by Jerry Capisi from 1990, we're told that across the street here was his used auto lot where he would sell cars. And I'm going to cite an article from 1990, as I said, by Jerry Capisi. So either over there or perhaps over here, because this is a pretty big empty lot here. There's an article from October of 1990 where uh, Patty Testa gets arrested with what's said to be a nephew of his by the name of Fred Johnson. And apparently... What these guys did was they beat up some crackhead that stole a car radio. And eventually they get arrested for that. And Jerry Capisi makes a point of noting that his garage is here across the street at 432 East 89th, across the street from his used car lot. So it was the garage here and across the street a used car lot and then i'm also asking canarsie residents people have emailed me that um some guy emailed me once that he knew patty he bought a car off him so you know anyone that wants to comment about all this please leave a comment So we'll walk to the corner here and we'll keep talking. Now, now it was said that, that Roy was dragged, put in the back of his caddy, and then they drove the car and left it on Eamons Avenue by the Veruna Boat Club. And we'll get to that. Another thing, of course, if you know the history of these guys, in December of 1992, also in this garage here. Patrick Testa was murdered when a man in sunglasses and a dark fedora busted in screaming and then he got blasted. That man is supposedly Frank Lastarino. Um, I believe that might have came from Al Diarco who said that. 
and um, it happened inside this garage as well. So he would have been maybe in this garage, he had an office, and uh, he lost his life almost 10 years after Roy in that same garage. And Al Diarco also made a point to mention when he went witness that Center, Joey Testa, and Patty Testa did become made men. Um, and, you know, Patty Testa played a vital role, you know, when Vic and Gas Paper on the run, he was supplying cars for them, he was passing messages to them. You know, it's a lot of people believe Patty shouldn't have been killed, that it was a load of shit, and uh, obviously Gas Pipe was a fucking psychopath, and he was paranoid, and all types of crazy stuff was going on at that time. So there's a couple of incidents that happened here on this block on East 89th Street. Canarsie history over here. Mafia history. American history. Right behind these walls. So we covered that this was the place where Roy was murdered. We covered that this was the place where Patty Tester was murdered as well. And we're gonna head over to a couple other spots as well before this video ends. So once again, it's uh, said that the garage was right here on this block, which accounts for the addresses of 432 to 452 East 89th Street. And the numbers are going up as we go this way. The numbers do go up. And then behind me over here, and uh, perhaps we'll get a look into this lot, one of these lots here, was the used auto lot where Tesla was selling cars out of. And I, like I said, once again, Canarsie residents, people from the area, leave some comments, let me know. Was this the lot right here? It looks like a car lot. Let's uh, get up in there. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah. So that looks like a good place to sell cars out of. And then across the street, you know, you have your garage where you can fix cars that you've sold. Maybe you got some kind of warranty or something happens. And hey, maybe you sold them a fucking lemon and you got to fix it up. So... Once again, we're on East 89th Street in Canarsie. And then up over there is Avenue D, which also holds addresses to this massive building right here. I'll put a picture of like the blueprints for this building because I was kind of confused as to this address because as many times I go out, these addresses disappear over time. But I had to find some property uh, layouts and stuff to really make sure I was coming to the right location. All right, guys. Now, let's get one more look up the block and we'll get one more look at these garages over here and then we'll head out to the next spot. So far, this is going good and uh, I hope you're enjoying it. Let's get a look down here into this garage. Canarsie, Brooklyn. Where Roy DeMeo and Patrick Testa, almost 10 years later, took their last breaths. I'll see you guys in a bit. All right, guys, we are in the Sheepshead Bay section of Brooklyn now. We're on East 28th Street and Eamons Avenue. There's East 28th right there. Let's pan over here. The Varuna Boat Club, right there. All right. Pretty cold, we're right by the water over here. So for the events that we're about to speak about, I am going to talk from the FBI files. Now some believe, and it might be true that somebody from the Varuna Boat Club over here called about this car being here but let's read from the files here okay and uh you know some of the names are redacted whether they be some of the cops or other stuff 
Um, but uh, you can imagine, I don't know, Kenny McCabe, Frank Pergola, all these names, you know, probably one of them, all these guys that were involved in this case here. So let's look here while I read this. We're going to hang back here and we're going to look at this island. I'm actually standing on this island right here. This is a little island in the middle here. And there's one up ahead also. Okay. This paper is dated January 22nd, 1983. On January 10th, 1983, blank New York City detective observed DeMeo's vehicle, a 1983 Cadillac bearing the license plate 5001 ARS, parked on East 28th Street in Eamons Avenue, Brooklyn, in the center island. So where I'm standing, over here in the center island. Uh, he called the license tag into a friend and said the car looked strange in the area. There was no hit on the plate because there was no reports of it missing or stolen or a Roy or anybody missing. Detective Blank continued to observe the car parked in the same spot. And on January 20th, 1983, he took the VIN number and ran it through a friend at the NYCPD Auto Crime Squad where they ran the pin, well, they ran the VIN number, and then uh, they found out, and they immediately made the connection. Okay. Let's turn the page here. The ongoing federal task force investigation, especially since four members of the Auto Crime Squad are presently assigned to the task force. This notification made 11 a.m. on January 20th, 83. Uh, they notified the sergeant of the task force and the vehicle was seized at 11:35. now they called up walter mack you guys know who that is to get consent to enter the trunk which they did the vehicle was locked and there was the vehicle this fucking car was going off before i guess it's gonna go off again messing me up over here i'm just gonna wait for that to uh stop all right, two minutes later, that car has decided to shut up. So we're across the street. We'll get another look at this island here at East 80, East 89, no, East uh, 28th. There's an island there. There's an island over here as well. All right, so where were we? Yeah, so they got permission to get into this trunk. Um, now, they first observed the vehicle was locked and there were no signs of foul play. They then arranged to have the vehicle towed to NYCPD Highway Unit located in Flatbush Avenue. So, they went to that Highway Unit number two on Flatbush Avenue. So, they didn't open the trunk here, guys. Let's clear that up, number one. The trunk was not opened here. After sitting here for 10 days, they got permission to tow this truck to that Highway Unit to look inside that trunk. If you ever come around here, that place, Rolling Roaster, is pretty good. They got like uh, roast beef sandwiches and all types of cool stuff. It's been there for a very long time. So right over there, Rolling Roaster, check it out. Check it out if you're ever in the area. Free business plug, as I always do. Although they don't need the plug and they do very well. So. We're over here on Eamons Avenue, once again, by the Varuna Boat Club. And uh, this is where Royce Cadillac was spotted. This is where they left the car, right here on one of the center islands. Now, the car stood out because it wasn't in the parking lot. A lot of people say, oh, it was in the parking lot of this boat club, this and that. So here's a lot where they're storing some boats. Um, I don't even know if they have a parking lot, to be honest with you. It was in the center island, standing out. Didn't look right. All right, so I think we went over those events after what happened over in uh, Canarsie where we just left at Tessa's garage. They drive the car over here and they leave it. Gets towed over to Highway 2, Flatbush. Now we're gonna try to head over there didn't look like there was much parking, so i got to be creative. I don't know how I'm going to get over there, but we'll figure it out, guys. We will figure it out. I'm just glad I got to show you this spot, and we'll continue to show you more. 
So far, it's been pretty good. Aside from me freezing my ass off. All right, let's get out of here. All right, guys, I am uh, parked somewhere where I shouldn't be, but unless I want to walk a mile and a half down Flatbush Avenue, there's no way I'm going to get this shot. So right there, what you're looking at is Highway Patrol Unit 2, and you see there's a parking lot right there. Now, they told Roy DeMeo's Cadillac to this parking lot, and that is where they open up the trunk. When the trunk was opened, the body of Roy DeMeo was observed laying sideways with a chandelier lying on top. So he had a chandelier lying on top. He appeared to be shot four times. Twice in the head, once in the chest and back. He also had bullet holes in his hands. His leather jacket was removed and wrapped around his head. Now, I want to cue in on that detail right there. Leather jacket wrapped around his head. Well, echoes of the Gemini method, right? Shoot him in the head, wrap a towel or something, a cloth or something around the head. Pretty eerie. Then they say that... He was probably dragged to the car and placed in the trunk because his undershirt was pulled up under his arms, indicating he was shot and dragged somewhere. Now, they dusted the car and examined the vehicle for evidence. Dry blood stains were found on the back seat, indicating that one of the killers must have gotten blood on his clothing at some point and sat in the rear seat while they drove the car to the Emmons Avenue location. Now let's go over the inventory of the vehicle. A key ring with nine rings, miscellaneous papers, handwritten notes, a hunting knife, so he had a knife, and I'll put up the pictures of what the back seat looked like. There was also a book back there, uh, I don't know if it was the New Yorker magazine or the magazines about the front uh, page was talking about the drug trade, drug drugs and drug trafficking. There were no blood stains in the front seat of the car. No wallet or other personal possessions were recovered, so we know Albert DeMeo talks about him leaving his wallet and everything at home. Once again, we're looking at Highway Patrol Unit 2 on Flappish Avenue. This parking lot was where Roy DeMeo's Cadillac was towed to, and they opened the trunk. Okay, now listen to this. I know you guys have heard some of this. A microphone, parentheses for his own purposes, and a tape recorder had been removed. So there was the tape recorder and a microphone. And this is where Roy's Cadillac was towed. His 83 Cadillac towed to this location where they opened up that trunk, right on Flatbush Avenue. Then they notify the family of what happened, and the news spreads. Obviously, people in the families knew that Roy was dead already, but the news spreads throughout the city. And then after this, little bit, little bit by little bit, more details of this crew starts coming out. And then it's all the history that we know now from the informants, you know, guys like Dominic Montilio, Vito Arena, Broadway Freddie Denomi. You know, these guys helped put the pieces together to really get a clear picture of everything that was going on with this crew. Of course, they were already on to Roy. They knew about the uh, Empire Boulevard car operation, but, you know, they weren't, you know, if you read through the FBI, little by little, you see the death count of the crew rise. 50 people, 125. Now we think it's 150. Now we think it's 200. Little by little, as they start investigating, they start figuring out that, man, this is some fucking crazy shit going on with these guys. So once again, Highway Unit Patrol 2, there's the parking lot, there's the main building over there. 
And this is where Roy, that picture that you see with Roy in his trunk, taken right here, guys, right in this lot. And I hope uh, I gave you guys a clear picture of what happened here on January 20th of 83. Unfortunately, I can't get too close. There's really nowhere to park here. So I'm on the shoulder here with my hazards on. Let's zoom in a little bit. And there's the parking lot. Man, this is where it ended, guys. This is where it all ended. And this is where my video is going to end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing it. And uh, I think it's going to come out well. Uh, I'm going to put it out on the 10th of January, which is when you'll be watching this. All right, guys. Let's uh, sign off. I think I covered everything. Highway Unit Patrol 2, Flatbush.